Welcome to First Unitarian. We gather on Sundays to celebrate life, to witness to truth, and to be with each other in life's challenges and joys. All week long, we're building a community, one connection and one person at a time. We care for each other and our children, we grow our souls, and we transform our world. We're glad you're here. Welcome home. morning. Good morning audibly? I don't know about the online. Okay, all right. I know you all, met, or many of you could hear me, not all of you probably, but our online folks for the congregation with us that's joining us online, just want to make sure that we can all hear each other. Welcome to Sunday morning at the First Unitarian Church of Rochester. Here, through spiritual connection in community, we listen deeply to others and ourselves, we open to wonder and transformation, and we serve together with love and humility. I'm the Reverend Sherry Halliday Kwan. I'm the lead minister here. I serve with my ministerial colleague, AJ, who is off today. Sometimes we take breaks. Yeah, it's a nice thing. But there are a whole lot of other people making Sunday morning happen today. It includes Brownlee, our lay worship associate. We've got Eric and Emily and Gabe up in our AV lock. There are ushers out in the lobby, here in the sanctuary, online. We've got Tommy Snell, our music director, making music. But it's not just Tommy. We've got a whole lot of chairs behind me because our ukulele orchestra is back. Yeah. <laughs> And a special introduction today, joining us for the next couple of months as our accompanist is Joe Janover. Welcome, Joe. Now, Joe is multi-talented. He not only plays the piano and the ukulele, but he's also going to light our chalice. And I discovered today that he lit a match for the first time this morning. <laughs> Yeah, church is a place for new discoveries and skills. It is a place to take risks, to lean into new experiences. If you're new or newish here, I invite you to connect at our welcome desk or fill out a connection form online so that we can help you connect with other people. We're a large congregation and we spend Sunday mornings together here as well as with our children and youth upstairs or outside or online. And it's really important to be able to connect with people in smaller groups throughout the week in various ways. So help us help you to do that. We enter here for those of us in the sanctuary and many joining in the Rochester and Finger Lakes area on the ancestral and contemporary current land of the Haudenosaunee people. And if you are joining from some other part of the world where the indigenous people of that land are different, I invite you to share that in the chat. I'm not gonna invite you here in person because we're all in the same place. So instead, I'd like to invite you to take a look around, fix someone in your gaze and say hello.
you all have some mighty lengthy hellos, and I love that about you. You all are my kind of people. It is good to be together. It would not be Sunday morning without you. And I want to invite you after the service today, if you are interested in protecting democracy, to join at the UU The Vote launch party. This emerging effort here in the congregation could use your help. And so if you're looking for a way to channel some extra time or energy, or extra is not even the right word, but you want to make a difference in the world, and protecting democracy is your corner, I invite you to join with that team. More immediately, I invite you to join in our unison words. Joe's going to light our chalice here in the sanctuary. If you are at home, I invite you to light a chalice wherever it is that you happen to be. As for the rest of us, let us say our unison words together. May the flame we now kindle inspire us to use our power to heal with love, to help with compassion, to bless with joy, and to seek liberation in the fullness of community. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone today? Good. Uh, I went to college in the 70s, and uh, I was also in a co-op program, which meant that uh, after my freshman year, I would alternate going to school and then having a work program where I was an, essentially an intern uh, in my chosen profession, which was engineering. And it was the Monday morning uh, after Christmas, and I had spent the Christmas holidays with my parents in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and then uh, I needed to get back to my co-op assignment, which was in Mattoon, Illinois, which is essentially in the center of Illinois. So I got uh, up and headed out on a snowy morning, and uh, my Ford Pinto and I made it all the way to Indianapolis, Indiana, where on a snowy and slick uh, freeway overpass. I spun that pinto around, smashed into a guardrail in the middle of the median, and that's where I stopped. Now, well, thankfully, uh, some older folks stopped by and, needed, and asked if I needed help, and I said I needed to get to a payphone. And so they, I got in the car with them and headed out, and they continued on the interstate uh, and eventually found uh, the exit for the airport and uh, dropped me there knowing that there'd be plenty of pay phones and it would be warm uh, on, a, on a cold day. And I called my parents and uh, somehow they figured out how to get me a taxi to get back to my car, which was now on the other side of Indianapolis, uh, to get me my car towed and to a collision repair shop, uh, to get me a room for the night at the Motel 6 where they left the light on for me. And, uh, <laughs> and to get me a bus ticket to Mattoon, Illinois the next day. And isn't that why we come to church? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, we can come here when things are really going well and we want to invest our time and treasure in making the world a better place. But we can also come here when things are not going very well and where we need a helping hand or just uh, a warm person to talk to. And if you were here a couple weeks ago, we, inter we installed our new pastoral care team and they are ready, willing, and able and ready to help out in your time of need. And I'm heading back to Indianapolis this year and wish me luck.
We are a people who gather in music and in word, but also in our bodies. We are a people of mind and spirit and heart, and also of bodies. And I make this explicit because I want to be clear that for those of you who are here in the sanctuary, you've traveled here, there's been some material change in which you had to move to bring yourself here. And for everyone who's joining us, no matter where you are or how you're joining us, there's probably been some movement. But especially when you're joining us online, it can be hard to remember that you too are a body, that we too are bodies. And so we try to do more and more embodied practice together. We gather in music and word and silence, but also in our bodies. And so I share with you an embodied practice that's a little bit different today. It's a dance move that was popular in Western China around 2009. But before we get into that, I want you to settle into your seat if you happen to be seated, if you're somewhere else and you're standing or reclining, settle. Find comfort and some movement with your arms. And I want you to call to mind something that's mildly uncomfortable. For me, that's the fact that I'm about to teach you a dance move. <laughs> but for you, it might be grocery shopping or a hard conversation. Nothing too challenging, but something that you'd maybe put off just a little bit. As you hold that experience in your mind, it lives somewhere in the body, perhaps in your shoulders or in your jaw or between your shoulder blades. 
So I invite you to take your hands and put them about a foot apart. This is a little fish. You're going to have a little fish, and then you're going to have a big fish. And then, just like you do with a fish, you're going to put it on a shelf. <laughs> put it on the other shelf. <laughs> big fish, little fish, put it on the shelf, put it on the shelf. So I want you to find wherever that discomfort lies. If it's in your jaw, or if it's in your core, or if it's in your shoulders. It's a big fish. Big fish, little fish. Put it on the shelf, put it on the shelf. We're going to do it one more time, because the folks online, I know, when I'm online, I think I'm going to get away with someone not seeing me participate. <laughs> I'm just going to invite you in, give you another chance. Big fish, little fish, put it on the shelf, put it on the shelf. We're going to use that later. Thank you all. Our time of contemplation and prayer begins with a reading from the writer Anne Lamott. I am going to be 68 in six days if I live that long. I'm optimistic, mostly. God, what a world. What a heartbreaking, terrifying freak show. It's completely ruining my birthday plans. I was going to celebrate how age and the grace of myopia has given me the perspective that almost everything sorts itself out in the end, that goodwill and decency and charity and love always eventually conspire to bring goodness into the troubled waters, that the crucifixion looked like a big win for the Romans. But turning 68 means you weren't born yesterday. Turning 68 means you've seen what you've seen. Ukraine, Sandy Hook, the permafrost, Marjorie Taylor Greene. By 68, you have seen dear friends ravaged by cancer, lost children, unspeakable losses. The midterms are coming up. My mind is slipping and my dog died. To use theological terms, it is just too friggin' much. And regrettably, by 68, one is both seriously uninterested in a vigorous debate on the existence of evil, or even worse, a pep talk. So what does that leave? I'm glad you asked. The answer is simple. A very few best friends with whom you can share your truth. That's the main thing. By 68, you know that the whole system of our lives works because we are not all nuts on the same day. You call someone and tell them that you hate everyone and all of life, and they will be glad you called. They felt that way three days ago and you helped pull them out of it by making them laugh or a cup of tea. You took them out for a walk or to Target. And besides our friends, getting outside and looking up and around changes us. The same writer, Anne Lamott, she advises us that prayer really only takes three main forms. Help, thanks, and wow. And so in this spirit and with her guidance, 
in celebration of her birthday. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life, God of many names, and one abundant love, source of beginnings and endings, that space between our synapses, that space between the shoulder of the person nearest to us. Into this silence, may we lift up silently in our hearts all that we might respond to with a wow. And since we are leaning into the guidance of other teachers today, let us take a page from our Pentecostal siblings, and I invite you at home or here in the sanctuary to say aloud with me all that makes you proclaim, wow. Snow on the crocuses these beautiful faces, the color blue. If wow renders us a bit quiet, we'll move on to thanks. I invite you in your heart to bring to mind one thing for what you give thanks today. And again, aloud, I invite you to name that which you give thanks. Voice. We close with help. It is the hardest of the three. Here in this sacred gathering, May we be helped to deepen our wells of compassion. May we be helped when we are worried or anxious for ourselves or the people we love. May we be helped with illness of mind or body with human frailty in its many forms. May we find help in unexpected places. May it be so. Amen. Here in community, our time of contemplation, of meditation, of prayer, draws us closer to that which connects us to the strings that tie us together, unseen, to the ground of all being, and that which is most holy, most sacred. But to put it in theological terms, sometimes alone, it is just too friggin' much. Here in this sacred hour and sacred gathering, we gather to bear witness to each other's lives, to all that is growing, to that what we grieve, to all that is a gift. In grief or gratitude or growth, I invite you to write into the chat 
or to rise here in the sanctuary and light a candle in the loving embrace of this community. For all these prayers and for all those left unsaid, we gather in love, we gather to witness to each other. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be.
Each week, members and friends generously contribute to our offering, which helps to sustain and grow our community. This collection supports the work and witness of this church, and each week we give half of our collection to a partner organization, helping those in need and working to create a more just and loving world. This week, we're sharing the plate collection with the People's Pantry, previously known as the South Wedge Food Program. The People's Pantry is an emergency food pantry on Avenue D at the corner of Joseph Avenue. They provide groceries to individuals and to families to mitigate the effects of food insecurity. During the pandemic, they became the largest free grocery delivery service in Rochester. You can give online at rochesterunitarian.org slash donate or by Venmo or Simple Church. And here in our sanctuary, the ushers will pass collection baskets. Our offering will now be received with gratitude. It is so good to have the or ukulele orchestra back. Thank you all for playing. A couple of years ago, I lived almost the entirety of my life in one room. It was early in pandemic, and my wife and I had just moved into a house that was larger than anything we had ever occupied. We'd spent the entirety of our relationship in New York City and went from a one-bedroom apartment to a two-bedroom apartment to a 2,500-square-foot house that we expected to fill with people, with guests and visitors and roommates, and suddenly it was just us. And so we moved into our living room almost entirely. We brought the kitchen table in. I set up an office in one corner. On Wednesdays, on trash day, Ira Sol, who's sitting in the front row and lives down the block, would come walking by on his nightly walk. And I'd see him, because I was taking out the trash. But most days, I was in the living room. We had the fireplace on. My wife would recline on the couch. It was cozy. It was nice. 
that didn't stave off the complexity a few weeks and months later as this once romantic narrowing of our lives suddenly became a bit claustrophobic. All 2,500 square feet couldn't change the fact that my wife's industry as an opera singer had collapsed, while I, in her words, apparently spent 19 hours a day on Zoom calls. <laughs> the early coziness did nothing to change the challenge of living in close proximity, but ultimately occupying two very different worlds where she suddenly had much more time on her hands than she expected. And I, in the work that I do, and this community in which I am interwoven in, with the ministerial colleague whose mom died of COVID early on, suddenly had no time, no space for her. It's been a couple years since then, and we've worked through it, which is why I share it with you now, but it's an experience that I've heard reflected by many of you, if not in the context of pandemic, at some other point in your life. Close proximity to people didn't necessarily mean connection. We live in a pandemic of loneliness, as well as the ones that you're more intimately acquainted with or more explicitly acquainted with these days. Most American adults say that they do not have someone with whom to share their deepest questions, concerns, and sentiments, most Americans. The overwhelming majority of us don't have more than three people whom we trust with the most important facets of our lives. For those who've been members of this congregation for decades, one of the things I hear again and again is, this is where my people are. These are my closest friends. And I hope that is true for all of you, but I know that it is not. I know that that close proximity that we find ourselves in, and yet being unable to share what is deepest within us, well, that also exists here in this room or in these Zoom boxes. Perhaps we see the same faces each and every week, but we don't necessarily know the people next to us. I'm a bit depressed by this as your spiritual leader, I'll admit. I don't think it applies to all of us with equal measure, but I think it's common enough that it's worth tackling head on. And the good news is, is that tackling it head on actually does make a difference. And that in a year, by simply doing the thing that you're already doing now, which is coming to church, this could change. I'd like to take an informal poll. If you're here in the sanctuary, I invite you to close your eyes. And we do this for the privacy of others. So please participate. And if you're online, I'd ask you to just look away from your screen for a moment. And if the following statements apply to you, I'd ask you to raise your hand. I have more than three people in my life I can call when I'm feeling depressed or lonely or scared. I 
I have one person in my life I can call or text or email. I am sometimes lonely. I have had the experience of being physically close to people and yet feeling like I lack connection. You can open your eyes again. For those of you who weren't cheating, I'll fill you in. It's a lot of us, my friends. It is a lot of us, and there are seasons of our lives, but the good news is that intentionally and explicitly tackling it, addressing it head on, is something we can change in a year by ultimately doing almost the same thing we're doing right now. One of the things I have heard again and again from folks in this community, as well as just people I know who have moved to new cities, tried to build new communities, tried to make new friends, is that it is really hard to make friends as an adult. When people say this, I wonder if they remember what middle school was like. Because <laughs> it's not easy then, either. But most of us did it. Not all of us, by any means, but most of us did it. We just did the thing that we don't often get an opportunity to do now, which is show up again and again with the same people and do things together. It's a surprisingly simple formula, going for a walk, or going to Target, or making a cup of tea. But the formula of showing up and doing things again and again is how most of us made it through middle school. This same magic is available to us as adults, my friends. This same magic, this same formula, is just on the shelf. My same wife, the darling, beautiful, brilliant human, who about two years ago I was starting to feel awfully closed in with, is some sort of social genius. When we moved to Rochester, she sent out emails to everyone we know and posted on Facebook a simple message. Hi, we're moving to Rochester. Do you know people there? Maybe you can introduce us. And then Elizabeth proceeded to apply step two to her particular formula. She waited for answers to pour in, and in a surprising fashion, they did pour in. This isn't always the case, but it's surprising how often simply taking a risk and saying, we could use friends, or we'd like to meet people, brings a harvest that most of us would find challenging to follow up on. But Elizabeth, prompted by the deep, an unrelenting knowledge that if she didn't make friends first, I would. <laughs> and that her standards for the people that she hangs out with are a little more particular than mine. <laughs> she was motivated. And so she proceeded to have coffee, intentionally, with quite a few people up until when COVID hit. Her fruits have borne a rich harvest in my life. Friends that both of us can stand, that both of us delight in, that really just involved her taking a risk and naming the thing that is true for the vast majority of people in this room 
which is we don't have enough deep connections where we are, and we'd like some more. So it's here where I ask us to remember that big fish, that big fish that becomes a little fish that we put on the shelf. Our feelings of discomfort, the anxieties that we hold, the challenges that we face are not meant to be dismissed or ignored. The ways in which making friends as an adult is difficult is not something that I'm suggesting we discount or label false. But we can put it on the shelf. You can always take it off later on, but putting it on the shelf for just a moment as we move through a relatively simple formula. We're going to get more mathy in this formula. When I talk about middle school and the bonds formed in this critical period, it turns out, like almost everything else in middle school, it's overkill. It's way more time than you need to build deep friendships. Many of us, as we look around, if you've been here a few times, probably recognize a few people. Maybe you'd count quite a few of them as acquaintances. You're friendly with them. Maybe you know their name. Maybe you call them hun, because you don't remember their name. I get that. It's hard with masks these days. And really and truly, if we're trying to make deeper friendships here, I'd like to encourage all of you right now to lean into the practice of reintroducing yourself for really the next year. Just assume that folks need a reminder of your name. It's a friendly thing to do. To move from that acquaintance level to a friendship, how long do we think it will take? Do we have any guesses here? Five years. Anyone else? Five months. Five months. A half hour. A half hour. <laughs> a half hour. <laughs> you must have a lot of deep friends. <laughs> yeah. We're not talking best friend level, but just to the level of friendship, where it's not weird if you text them or call them, usually one or the other, depending on that friend's preferences. To move from acquaintance to friend, the average length of time you need to spend together, not necessarily even in deep and direct conversation, but simply doing something together, is 30 to 40 hours. So if you show up at church and hang around afterward once a month, that'll take you about five years. If you show up every week, it'll take you eight months. Within a year, you will not fundamentally change the experience of loneliness. I do not guarantee that you will never feel alone. I do not guarantee that there will not be times where you do not know to where to turn or whom to call. But it is a science-backed formula, a data-driven in an American context way of deepening relationship. I don't aim to form a community and a congregation of people who are more outgoing, of people who have a parade of potlucks, not because it's a moral good do I want you to have more friends, 
because it feels fun or fashionable, though both of those things are true. But I want it for you because in the care of community, your soul can be most healed and most held. I want it for you because a correlation, not necessarily causation, but a deep and repeated correlation between deep loneliness and life expectancy suggests that not having three people with whom to share things that matter to you is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. There is no moral judgment or stigma attached to being lonely, just as there is no moral judgment or stigma attached to smoking cigarettes. But I want deeply for you to live, my people. I want deeply for you to have connections of meaning and value. Here, too, is the good news. I know, based on the laughter around middle school, that most of us didn't go through life believing we were the cool kids. And yet, in this making of friends, you don't have to be that weird. You don't have to suddenly go to your deepest and darkest secrets. You don't have to suddenly trust someone with your wallet or your children or your life. This 30 to 50 hour benchmark, it applies to casual conversation. It applies to carpentry projects. It applies to bowling and it most effectively applies to volunteering together. We return to Anne Lamott, who talks about friends being the main thing, the few very best friends that she has, that she's grateful for not all being nuts on the same day. Besides our friends getting outside and looking up, and around changes us, she says. Remember, you can trap bees on the bottom of mason jars with a bit of honey and without a lid because they don't look up. They just walk around bitterly bumping into the glass walls. This is me. All they have to do is look up and fly away. So we look up. In 68 years, I have never seen a boring sky. I have never seen felt blasé about the moon or bird song or paper whites. It is crazy drunken clown college outside our windows now, almost, almost too much beauty and renewal to take in. The world is warming up. How does appreciating spring help the people of Ukraine? If we believe in chaos theory and the butterfly effect and the flapping of a monarch's wings near my home can lead to a weather change in Tokyo and then maybe noticing beauty flapping our wings with amazement changes things in ways we cannot begin to imagine. It means goodness is quantum. Even to help the small world helps. Even prayer, which seems to do nothing, Everything is connected. But quantum is perhaps a little esoteric in our current condition. Mine, I'm sure you're just fine. I think infinitely less esoteric stuff at 68. Probably best to have both feet on the ground or our seat in the seat to ogle the daffodils take a sack of canned goods to the food pantry and pick up trash. It helps our insides enormously. And so I celebrate the absolute astonishing miracle that I specifically was born. 
As Frederick Buechner wrote, the grace of God means something like, here is your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. So I celebrate that I have shelter and friends and warm socks and feet to put in them, and that God, or Gus, found a way to turn the madness and shame of my addiction into grace. I'll shake my head with wonder, which I do more and more as I age, at all the beauty that is left and all that still works after so much has been taken away. So celebrate with me. Step outside and let your mouth drop open. Feed the poor with me, locally. Eat with me. If you want to buy me something, make a donation. My party will not be the same without you. Each of us are invited to somebody else's party. We are invited to the party of our deep down and lonely soul that needs the company of another. There are some among us for whom being held in connection is never doubted while alone. But that is not most of us, my friends. For most of us, our souls require, demand, yearn for friendship. And here in community, here in community, our friends are only just waiting. And so I invite you, after our service today, to do a couple of things. You might think about coming to the UU The Vote launch party. It's a way to volunteer with other people, making structural change, deeply important work. But you might also consider sticking around after the service in connection hour online or in person, not for a full hour, unless you really want to make it through in five months. <laughs> and talk with someone, with a small group, get to know each other. Ask them about their childhood friends, about middle school, about what they plan to wear for Halloween. It's really early, but it's a good question for people who don't want to talk about middle school. <laughs> I have another invitation. After church, in times past, we've had coffee and snacks. And we need small teams, groups of people working together again and again, building connection to help make this possible. And so after the service, if that's something that you are interested in in the future, let me know. We're looking for people every Sunday, and we won't do it until we have the teams to gather again and again, facilitating this connection, this holy container. We're going to practice one more time Whatever the shyness, or anxiety, or fear, or schedule that holds you back from deepening the connections you already have or making new ones is, I invite you to take that big fish, make it a little fish, put it on the shelf, put it on the shelf. You can always get it later, my friends. But for now, let us deepen into friendship. Let us leave the fabric of connection that holds us all. Take a look around, in gallery view or here in person, making eye contact with someone and saying hello. May this be the start of a beautiful conversation. Amen.
body and spirit and join with us in singing Blue Boat Home. Though below me I feel no motion Standing on these mountains and plains Far away from the rolling ocean Still my dry land heart can say I've been sailing all my life now Never harbor or port have I known The wide universe is the ocean I travel And the earth is my blue boat home Sun my sail and moon my rudder As I fly the starry sea unison chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Truth and commitment, my friends, are what brings us into community. Here in community, may we know that you have found a place of belonging. May we turn and create it for others again and again. Now that our service has ended, let us do the work of the church, the work of community, the work of love and justice in the world. Go in peace and love. One, two, three, one, ready, go.